Hello, and welcome to the Health Go Live webinar series. Today's episode is brought to you by your friends at Medallion. We would like to remind you that the Q&A feature is available, so feel free to send in your questions for the panel throughout the discussion. Our speakers would love to hear from you. And with that, I will turn it over to Jessica Sharp, who joins us from Medallion. Great, thank you. And I think our panelists can come off as well. Awesome. Uh, so first, thank you to Health for uh, providing the platform for organizations like ours uh, and those in the audience to share our ideas and musings on all things healthcare. Uh, and to the audience, of course, thank you for joining us to have this conversation. Uh, over the next hour, um, we're going to discuss the why and how of building an informed ROI-driven business case for provider operations, uh, including the considerations, you need to evaluate uh, various types of ROI models uh, and pathways to discovering the best route for your organization. Uh, this becomes a, a never more important uh, as doing more with less often feels right, like the unavoidable directive and an impossible challenge with healthcare administration and operations. And so the question becomes for many organizations, how do I make the right decision uh, when it comes uh, to what to outsource and who to partner with uh, to ensure I can grow uh, and maintain a provider network that is able to deliver quality care. And so I'm joined by a stellar panel who I will let introduce themselves uh, in a moment, but we have with us Dr. Lindsay Jubelt, uh, Chief Population Health Officer at Mass General Brigham, and Matthew Ortiz, uh, VP of Payer Operations at Family Care Center. A um, Couple of quick PSAs before we get started. Uh, please feel free to drop in your questions into the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. We welcome questions throughout the discussion. Uh, we'll hopefully tackle many of them naturally, but if not, uh, not to worry, we'll save 15 minutes at the end uh, to do so. Uh, we also have a couple of polls sprinkled in, so please keep an eye out for those. Uh, we appreciate your feedback um, when we do. And so with that, let's kick off today with a round of introductions. Um, could each of you start with who you are, what you do, uh, and most importantly, what motivates you to do what you do? Matthew, uh, uh, let's start with you. Sure. Uh, thanks, Jessica. Uh, my name is Matthew. I lead uh, peer strategy <clears throat> and relations at Family Care Center, um, which is an outpatient behavioral health group uh, that operates in Colorado, Tennessee, and Texas. I've been with the company since April of last year, uh, and I'm based out of Nashville, Tennessee. Um, by way of background, I spent a couple of years um, at Anthem in Tennessee on the payer side, and, and I've spent um, time with a couple of other organizations um, in other areas of healthcare, namely uh, senior living and autism care. Um, as far as motivation, I've always uh, been a very mission-driven person, um, so each step um, along my professional career has kind of been with a company uh, with a very strong mission um, that are improving the lives of people, which is something I, you know, I feel really good about waking up every day and, and coming to work. Um, so I'm really happy to be here today and look forward to the discussion. Awesome. Lindsay? Hello. Good afternoon. I'm Lindsay Jubelt. I'm at Mass General Brigham, um, a healthcare organization with both a delivery system and a health plan in Boston. Um, what motivates me every day is that I think there's a gap uh, between what consumers are really looking for in healthcare and what uh, traditional healthcare offers. And so I get very jazzed to think about how to transform traditional healthcare to be a bit more oriented around the consumer. Awesome. We are very excited to have you both. Uh, as a quick introduction to myself, I'm Jessica Sharp. I head up client solutions at uh, Medallion, an organization. Uh, that provides services and software to essentially centralize and streamline provider operations. Uh, put more simply, we spend every day thinking about how to help organizations uh, like Matthews and Lindsay's uh, uh, credential license uh, and role uh, their providers faster without having to worry about the regulatory uh, compliance complexities related to those tasks. Um, I actually came to Medallion from being on the care delivery side myself, uh, driving growth with organizations whose tactical focus uh, and core priority was not what I just described, uh, but more like those of yours, creating and driving access to high quality care. So that is one of the many reasons I am very excited to have this conversation today, because the information uh, you'll gain hopefully is intended to ultimately help your organization spend more time on that uh, uh, and advancing uh, that mission. So 
diving right in uh, with a light question, uh, given the sort of broader uh, macroeconomic environment, uh, many industries, including healthcare, are under immense pressure from rising operating costs to financial challenges uh, like reduced budgets, uh, labor shortages, limited access to capital, et cetera. And so I'd like to start today's conversations with what both of you are seeing across the industry and how, uh, if at all, these factors are impacting your organizations. Uh, and so let's start first uh, with Lindsay. Uh, well, these are there are just um, monumental uh, factors affecting healthcare organizations today. Um, I think some of the ones to call out that are really um, affecting Mass General Brigham are uh, some of the, just the, as you said, the labor shortages. And so we've had um, the biggest inflation costs that we've seen in our labor since World War II. Um, it jumped up at the peak on uh, inflation of 40% on our labor. Um, but on top of that, we've got a lot of frontline work workers that are burned out. That happened right after the pandemic, but this seems to be stabilizing. And amongst our providers, something like 63% um, are, are claiming that they're burned out. And I think the challenge with this is that um, this is not just a local problem or a national problem. This is a global problem where, um, you know, America has been recruiting healthcare workers um, out, out of countries where there was more, where they were turning up more um, healthcare workers and also cost of living was lower. And so they're interested in moving to America to fill the gap. But we've kind of taken all that labor and that's gone. And so that's going to continue to be um, a strong headwind for a long time. We've seen some improvements. Um, on that uh, in the short term, but expect that to be just a strong um, headwind that we'll face over the long term. Another challenge that we're facing is, you know, in our in our um, large organization, most of our revenue still comes from the hospital side, and the health plan is a smaller share of the business. And hospitals are going to face increased pressure over recent years. And we've been in the hospital era for the past hundred years. You know, ever since 1920, when we invented antibiotics and anesthesia. Hospitals went from places that were respite centers for people without means to becoming places where technology was invented and where you could get the best care and state-of-the-art care. And since then, we've been growing and building these hospitals that have you know, large cost bases. And we now have technology advances, advances that allow us to move care out of the hospital, um, into the home, into virtual care. We, we're building out uh, we have the biggest home hospital program in the country, but even still, um, a lot of our um, revenue is based in the hospital. And so we're having to transform ourselves because um, the hospital's network here is going to be in the future. And so how do we start to rethink about this large um, bricks and mortar buildings that we've built where a lot of our costs go is to revamp, um, to think about the future where care is going to be closer to the home, closer to the consumer and more digital. Really, really insightful. Thank you, Lindsay, for sharing that. Matthew, how about um, on your side? Yeah, yeah, to piggyback on what Lindsay stated, um, you know, obviously, I think the healthcare sector is feeling the pressure um, that most other industries are experiencing post pandemic, you know, trying to operate in this crazy inflationary environment, um, having difficulty finding good candidates to fill openings and then keeping candidates long term, you know, um, to Lindsay's point about burnout, that's that's very indicative in, in our area. Uh, especially when it comes to positions that are more geared towards kind of entry level, you know, those entry level candidates, folks that are just starting their career. Um, those positions are, are much more difficult to fill than, you know, our, our clinical um, positions are. Um, and, and I'm kind of seeing this with other provider organizations, folks that I talk to, um, you know, in, in my um, network. But it's also something that I've seen impact health plans as well. You know, one of the services that we utilize um, Medallion for, which is the credentialing and payer enrollment um, component, is a really good example. You know, we've actually had payers admit to uh, um, longer credentialing lead times based on, you know, backlog and, and short staffing. So it's something that I think, you know, provider organizations in healthcare are seeing, um, as well as, you know, folks that are on the payer side. So, um, yeah. Yeah, um, we really appreciate both of uh, your feedback on that questions as these are the things and what you mentioned that we're seeing expose organizations to real risk. Um, but that you also mentioned, Lindsay, the right partnerships and technology can help to mitigate um, uh, as it relates to general labor shortages, as you both mentioned in the financial challenges, organizations are having to make really difficult decisions, right, about how to allocate resources that just are not unlimited. Uh, and so I recall a stat from, I think a year or two ago at this point from Mercer that projected 
around uh, a shortage of 12 million healthcare workers by 2030. So not that far away, right, in the distant future, um, right, related to a number of factors like the aging population, uh, shortage of qualified um, uh, workers, et cetera. And so I think it's reasonable then that attracting and retaining providers moves into the top priority um, as it relates to network management. But uh, that said, organizations still have to balance that with hiring, uh, training, and retaining quality uh, administrative staff to manage those providers so that they can actually see their patients. Uh, so that in and of, of itself requires uh, meaningful resources and um, like provider hiring retention. We've heard those challenges echoed by teams that manage the administrative staff side of, seeing, side of things. So similarly, organizations are having to prepare as their staff, right, approaches retirement age, they're not able to backfill those positions uh, with individuals who already have the specialized training and expertise to manage complex uh, state uh, and payer uh, regulations. Um, and so, yeah, the risk of unpredictable and high staff turnover, um, organizations are having to make, right, the difficult challenge um, or manage the difficult challenge of, of keeping up with provider growth needs and network uh, operations without maybe necessarily having the staff uh, or the resources to do so. And so with that, uh, I'd love to propose uh, our first poll question. Um, so I think it, you all may have received it already, uh, but the question is, uh, is your organization facing pressure to solve operational challenges uh, with less people or resources? And we'll give a little bit of time to run that poll. All right, responses are in uh, and resounding yes, 90% uh, of our uh, participants um, uh, responded yes to that, that uh, they are facing those, those challenges. And so, right, with all of that uh, mounting pressure, um, I'd love to dive into the respective approaches that each of you take to navigate that change. Uh, and if you can, I uh, would love to hear how your teams are doing that from specifically a resource time and or spend perspective. Uh, and so Matthew, let's start with you. Sure, um, I know here at FCC, um, we're really trying to be forward thinking um, and embrace technology. You know, our, our leadership team has really tried to champion kind of an outside the box way of thinking um, as far as how we can maneuver, you know, this current um, inflationary environment where we're dealing with staffing challenges and, and shortage of, um, you know, folks to, to fill the roles that we have and, and that we need to fill. Um, a major strategic venture that we started last year um, was deciding to partner with Medallion to help us manage the, the credentialing and payer enrollment process. Um, in my current role, it's it's very closely tied to revenue cycle management. Um, and in RCM, there's there's so many different departments uh, that manage processes that are really important to the business. Um, you know, some of the areas, you know, from my perspective, make more sense than others when it comes to deciding, you know, what to carve out. Um, what, what process or, or function to carve out and outsource. Um, but the credentialing function, in my opinion, was one that really just made a, a ton of sense um, for our organization. Um, you know, in all of my roles, I've always kind of been um, in positions that really has worked in tandem with, you know, the credentialing function. It's, it's something that's been really tough to staff historically. Um, it's hard to find the right, you know, folks that are willing to do that work and, and do it consistently for long periods of time. Um, and so, you know, that, you know, outsourcing that function has really um, been a, a godsend for us. Um, and then we're also utilizing different automation tools to help lighten the load on our staff. So that's something that has really exploded in the industry, I think, in the last five years or so. Um, so those are some of the main things that we're doing to help us um, navigate some of these new um, changes. And thanks for sharing, Matthew and Lindsay. How about uh, for your organization? Yeah, um, you know, National Brigham is a several hundred year old, over a hundred year old organization. And um, a lot of what got us to where we got to um, is not what's going to help us get into the future. Um, and that was a lot of uh, allowing for individual autonomy and um, a lot of sort of internal entrepreneurship um, and creativity. And we had this sort of that let a thousand flowers bloom approach. Uh, but that ne didn't necessarily lead to good um, resource and financial stewardship. So a lot of what we're putting in place are sort of more financial stewardship processes um, uh, and more kind of command control, moving away from where we were, just a very sort of organic, allowing everyone to make their own decision. Um, just this time of pressure is starting to kind of um, 
uh, centralize and put more kind of control processes in place. Um, but I, I agree with Matt that it's really exciting to see where some of the new technologies are going to bring us. You know, I think um, healthcare is finally maybe entering into the 21st century. We've seen retail go digital. We've seen banking go digital. Um, it's going to be awesome to see healthcare finally go digital. And I think that's where we're going to start to see um, a ton of opportunities to find efficiencies and not just efficiencies, but also how can we deliver care better that is more customized to different patient populations. Yeah, I could not agree more. Like some of the forcing functions are less than ideal, right? Like the, you know, shortage of staff, but uh, it is positive in that, you know, we're having to think about the technologies that exist and that other industries have really taken to sort of catalyst their business um, uh, and infuse it in, into healthcare, into different capacities. And so that's a really nice segue uh, uh, into our next question as we've been discussing and as our poll validated, uh, organizations are stretched uh, to do more with less. And so this burden, like we said, is sort of uh, imposed on all industries. Um, I'm really curious specifically how you see technology and or software tools fitting into the equation for healthcare. Do you want me to take that one? Was, was yeah, just... good. yeah, okay. sorry, you, Lindsay. Okay. Um, well, I, I mean, gosh, it can really just transform all elements of it um, from the back office to the front office. Maybe I'll say a couple of things and about the back office, but that may be more, you know, where Matt can uh, has more expertise than I do. Um, there's still so much that we have opportunity to transform in our supply chain. I think we're so fragmented across our large system. And so there's opportunity to rethink that, but not just across our system. There's opportunity to transform it across the lands landscape, starting to um, bring different um, data sets together uh, across different um, components of the supply chain beyond just our specific organization and think about how to utilize resources across our communities and with shared organizations. So one of our payer partners, we've been talking a lot about how do we work together with shared companies to best um, because we share patients and members between each other. How do we start to communicate better and think about using data more um, smarter, uh, but also how do we use resources in our communities better? So sniff beds have been got, gotten really scarce. How can we combine data sets to best use sniff beds? How can we combine us data sources to best use home health agencies and DME equipment? And so I think there's just lots of once you start to think about partnerships and solving problems beyond just your specific um, organization and start to take a patient-centered lens, I think a lot of new opportunities open up. Um, but there's also things on the um, kind of workforce side and training, what can we substitute with computers and algorithms? How can we speed up training? I think we've had really clunky training programs forever where technology can help us figure out how to train faster. And then finally, in terms of direct clinical care, I think there's so much care, particularly when you move away from just um, treating the patient in front of you to start to thinking about managing chronic conditions that we've kind of failed in. And a lot of that is because chronic condition management requires frequent feedback loops, like your diabetes, you measure your sugar, you wait to see your doctor for six months, nothing has happened, you go back in and maybe at that point you get your medications adjusted when really that could be, should, should and could be adjusted within, you know, a day. Um, with high blood pressure, meds work within 20 minutes. Like why are we waiting six months to go back to the doctor? We just don't have the haven't had the apparatus, the kind of operating model to do that. But I think technology can get us through that transformation faster of starting to actually take that population lens um, and use computers to start to help build those algorithms of frequent feedback loops and even use computers to start to um, chat with patients to provide them guidance. And that won't work for all populations, but it can work for a lot. And then we can free up our labor to focus on those that we really need to focus on. Yeah, absolutely. And then, I mean, from like a sort of just a data interoperability lens, making sure that we're all of that the right information data lives across the care continuum, that providers, uh, different organizations can access that to give that patient sort of the more holistic care that they're looking for. And then I think organizations are also trying to achieve um, and with great technology. And so Matthew would love, you know, hit on the back uh, end office uh, side of things, but what, what's your perspective on this? Yeah, I think obviously, you know, technology is the answer to doing more with less. Um, speaking broadly, you know, it's it's something that we've seen, you know, from care delivery and telehealth, you know, explode, um, especially, you know, once the pandemic hit, you know, during 2020, I, I had a couple of doctor's visits that were done via telehealth, which was a first for me and was a, a little interesting, but um, something that I think can be very valuable. Um, obviously, maybe not in Lindsay's arena and in the hospital setting, but there are a lot of services um, where telehealth can be very helpful. Um, you know, with with the growth of value-based care, 
Um, you know, we're we're starting to do some contracting that are you know that are based in in the value based arena and behavioral health, and you know, transferring information back and forth between the provider and the the health health plan is you know something that um, is very important. You know, it's vital to the success of you know those value based um, contractual arrangements that are that are in place, and so. Um, being able to utilize technology and, you know, sourcing that data, transferring it back and forth, and then analyzing it um, is extremely, you know, helpful. Um, from a revenue cycle perspective, you know, we're seeing automation and digital workers, I spoke about this a little bit earlier, but um, start to complete entire workflows that humans used to complete, um, you know, things like, you know, posting um, insurance payments, um, submitting claims, you know, there's just a number of different things that automation can really assist with. Um, I know, uh, you know, there are a lot of people that feel uncomfortable with that, you know, and outsourcing, you know, workflows to, you know, digital workers. But um, I think it's it's something that more and more organizations are going to have to get comfortable with in the future, just based on, you know, our, our current environment. Um, and so, you know, there's there's also a lot of different companies out there that offer, you know, complete offerings um, that allow organizations to free up the workforce um, you know, those resources to focus on other value added tasks, which, you know, we really try to look at here at FCC is, you know, what can we do um, to create more value for the organization? Um, and technology plays a major factor, I think, in that. Yeah, yeah. And I think from our perspective, it's really not an or statement, right? Technology or humans. It's with healthcare, like technology and humans. We right. always like need that human with like, you know, expertise and like deep training and whatever their core focus is uh, to support the healthcare industry at at, uh, at every stage. Uh, and so, you know, even just from like a, a, you know, quality control perspective and ensuring that the humans are maintaining the protocols that the organizations put in place, uh, there's a lot out there that uh, we can leverage. Um, or in our case, right? Like helping providers when a pandemic hits and all of a sudden telehealth becomes like the core focus, uh, get licensed in other states faster so that you can start right. seeing those patients. Um, all right. So let's say then you've made the uh, decision to invest in a tool, a platform, or, or even an outside service uh, to partner with. Um, how do you build a business case for what you need? Uh, and we'll go into the different measures of return in a, in a following question. Um, so it would be great if you can touch on here sort of the key variables that you consider and, and measure when starting to think about a business case framework uh, for investing in technology or, or services. And so Matthew, uh, let's start with you. Yeah, I think um, using my current organization as an example, you know, we really looked at our then current situation and and how efficient our operation was when it came to, you know, the credentialing function. Um, we were very honest with ourselves and understood that we had some gaps. Um, we had, you know, some difficulty in finding the right fits for those credentialing roles. And, and we knew there had to be a better path forward. Um, so, you know, we, we really examined what we thought it would take to continue building out um, a, you know, credentialing team and function and managing that function internally, taking in, into consideration things like, you know, employee training, um, recruiting, everyone knows how difficult that that can be, um, sourcing the, the right candidates, um, and then, of course, costs. Um, and then we took a look at, you know, potential partners and, and what those costs would entail. Um, obviously, the concerns of building out, you know, a team and, and the costs that come with that are not applicable when we're looking at outsourcing. So it was mainly us trying to quantify, you know, training related costs and, and the time frames that that would take. Um, and of course, the fees that would be included in executing, you know, a partnership agreement. Um, so we held a ton of different brainstorm sessions. You know, we had folks analyzing the data um, on the finance side um, and quickly came to the, to the conclusion that outsourcing made the most sense um, for us and, and have been proven right, you know, over the last year. Yeah. And Lindsay, how about um, on your side? I think um, as an organization, we've had such a history of believing we can do everything ourselves and the technology um, explosion has made us realize that as much as we spend um, an incredible amount of money on, on technology at our heart, we are a healthcare company, not a technology company. And so there's a lot that we can learn um, to outsource. And I guess the factors that come down to us is first, just, you know, do we have the specialized expertise in that area? Um, is, it a, is it incredibly connected to a core competency of ours or is it not? Um, does it give us a way to save money? Um, is there a way for us to get to better um, uh, 
scalability or their like time and time um, factors that we have to consider that maybe we could scale, but it'll take us forever. And so I think those are the, some of the factors that we consider, but historically we've had this notion of kind of believing we could do everything ourselves since we're having a cultural change where from a leadership standpoint, we're having to push a lot more people in our organization that are gonna have to adopt um, partnerships to say partnership is not bad, it's good. Uh, but it's really hard because that sometimes means people giving up their people or giving up control um, to sort of have um, kind of change the mind, mindset in terms of what does it mean to not control everything within the ecosystem within you work and you have partnerships. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it sounds like both of your organizations, though, taking a really like disciplined approach to thinking about like, okay, what are actually our core competencies and what are the optimization functions for our organizations? And like, you know, honestly saying like what can and maybe like should be outsourced so that we can advance those things uh, faster and further. Um, and so sort of at a, at a high level, and Maddie, we start with you, you can just like give us the audience an idea of the kind of step by step um, how you approach like building out an RI model. You mentioned your finance team is involved, sort of like mentioned um uh, right, the different things that you're looking at. Uh, you're also doing this with, right, right, like a partner who's helping you like measure those returns and what to expect. Um, so yeah, yeah. How do we get started? <laughs> yeah, so we, we look at, you know, a lot of different um, ROI kind of measures, I guess you could say, you know, so ROI that, that yields more time, you know, less cost, um, least amount of lost revenue uh, possible. You know, those are all really important for our organization. Um, as I stated earlier, you know, time savings really allows employees to, to focus on projects or, or tasks that positively impact, you know, the bottom line and, and culture, you know, the more time that we've got to do um, big, bigger picture items, you know, the, I think the better off for the staff and organization as a whole, you know, cost savings, obviously, you know, speak for themselves. I think every company out there, whether you're in healthcare or not, you know, is looking to cut costs, you know, where they can. Um, I think the lost revenue savings and in, in our kind of um, measurement of that it may have had the biggest impact on our decision um, to outsource our, our credentialing and payer enrollment operation. Um, you know, credentialing is one of the, the largest con contributors um, to denied healthcare claims. So that was something that was, you know, a huge uh, focus for us is, is how can we, you know, resolve these, these denials and, and what can we do better as an organization um, to kind of right size that. And, and so, you know, obviously if you cannot get reimbursed for the services that you're providing as a healthcare provider, you're not going to make it very far, um, as an organization. So, you know, to your point, just, I think, you know, there, there are certain things that make more sense to outsource than others, you know, so really trying to look at that and see, you know, where are you going to get the best ROI? Um, I think a lot of organizations have, have, you know, really struggle with giving up that control and, and, you know, not to say that folks are, you know, overwhelmingly micromanagers, but I think um, completely, you know, giving up a whole function of the business to an outside organization can be a little scary. But um, once you really kind of measure, you know, the, the return that you're going to get, if you give up something that you don't feel, you know, is your best, um, you know, attribute as an organization, you know, that like you said, there are things that some companies do much better than than other things. And so, if you focus on your strengths and maybe outsource, you know, a weakness as far as a department that, um, you know, you may struggle with, um, I think that that you're going to see a, a huge return to be able to focus on the things that you do well. So um, we really just kind of looked at all those different models and, um, you know, collaborated, you know, with our leadership team, our finance folks, and and you know the the numbers made sense. And again, we've we've been proven right and, and been very happy with our decision. Yeah, that's great. And we're going to talk a little bit towards the end about, you know, organizations who are thinking about like those trade-offs. Um, and I think very reasonable, there's, there's a little bit of fear there of like giving something away, feeling like you have less control over it. And so definitely want to talk about like for the audience, like what things you both look for uh, in a partner uh, to make a decision that you feel secure about. And so Staying on the topic of ROI, um, as we all talked about, right, there are multiple valid ways to measure a return outside of just pure dollar savings. Uh, so, for example, we can think about return on investment in terms of uh, savings, uh, growth savings, uh, time savings for your uh, employees, uh, or potential lost revenue savings. So, you shared some of the different measures that you all use uh, in that ROI calculation. Uh, but I'm curious, do returns like the uh, 
uh, time a full-time employee saves or gets back in their average day, um, having uh, to avoid hiring additional headcount um, to keep pace with growth or uh, the reduction of potential lost revenue uh, due to slower turnaround times, uh, for example, related to onboarding or credentialing, uh, how do those really compare to the value of direct financial cost savings? I'm curious how you guys think about those and sort of position those with the broader organization. Yeah, I, mean, I think those are, you know, like people talk about, um, you know, different characteristics that are are teachable or unteachable. And I think this kind of is, is relatable, you know, um, you, it's it's hard. It, it can be difficult to measure, you know, things like additional time savings or, um, you know, obviously it's it's easy to measure, you know, if, if you have to hire, you know, X number of less employees, you know, throughout um, the process, you know, those are things that are kind of easy, easily quantifiable. But um, I think if you can try to take a step back and look at the overall, you know, like what is this going to do for our organization culturally? What is this going to do? Um, to allow us to be, you know, the best version of ourselves as an organization, you know, and looking at how much extra time that we will have, you know, um, you know, there, there are things that you can spin your wheels on and spend time doing um, if you just, you know, outsource that that function that that just frees you up to do so many other things. And I think that those are um, those can't be understated and and can't be overlooked. I know it's easy for folks to just strictly look at, you know, financial costs, but um, in in the grand scheme of things, you know, there's a number of different factors that aren't, you know, easily uh, measurable that you really have to to take into consideration. Um, we we try to do that through the process. Again, you know, that's not something that maybe our finance folks were looking at because it's not, you know, dollars and cents that they can put into a spreadsheet. But um, you know, as as a leadership team, we came together and really talked through, you know, what we could do. Um, in allowing this function to to sit with, you know, a, a partner. Um, outside of Family Care Center, um, and it just made a lot of sense, you know, and and so we went that route, and and here we are. So yeah, yeah. Well, there are there are certainly right like like studies and organizations out there who are trying to quantify this just because of the importance. And I think there was one by Merritt Hawkins that estimated about ten thousand or could be like ten thousand dollars a day, right? Depending on the provider and like the uh, the services that they're rendering, um, ten thousand dollars a day is a, a lost due to like credentialing, like if they're not able to practice that day, right? So due to credentialing or onboarding um, delays. Um, and then there's another study I think that cited for healthcare administrative staff, administration staff, uh, that sort of administrative burdens, right? Like not having the tools or the resources and technology to do their job well or efficiently um, is one of the most important things when they think about workplace satisfaction. They're sort of tying back to this concern over labor shortages, really right, imperative that like we keep the staff that we have, we keep them happy and we allow them to do their jobs um, effectively and efficiently. So, you know. Yeah, <laughs> it, it is. It is twofold because you can look at it from the the back office function, and you know how can we save time and and save costs from the employee perspective. But you know, as you stated, Jessica, you know the the actual service provision side of the coin, where it is lost dollars if you're not getting folks credentialed appropriately and in, in, in a timely fashion, and if your process is broken, then you're talking about you know, hiring all of these providers that are already, you know, difficult to find. And then those providers not being able to provide services that you're able to bill for, you know, that's a huge conundrum and, and a massive issue that I think a lot of companies find themselves in. I um, mean, you know, I've been in healthcare for a long time and I don't know that I've um, really in previous experience seen um, healthcare organizations that feel like they've mastered the art of credentialing and paying enrollment it, for, I don't know what it is about that process, but it's always something that is finicky and and just hard to maneuver and and hard to really um, you know master and and get down to a science. So um, it, it's absolutely something that you've got to look at both sides and try to weigh the the pros and cons and, and financial benefits. Yeah. What I want to add to this discussion is that thinking about an outside partner to help an organization beyond just selling their product. So. Jessica, you're absolutely right. Like, and Matt, like the time that is ticking between when the offer letter goes out to a provider when they can start billing is just money down the drain, and that's always too long. Um, but I think, Matt, to your point, is like credentialing has historically been a challenging process. And I think a lot of that is because there hasn't been anyone, often it is fragmented across an organization and different departments that play a role in it. Um, and so there's like lack of accountability to really streamlining the process, or even if there's accountability, lack of authority to do so. And so as a partner on something like that, getting in there and 
um, doing a little bit more than just selling the product of offering to kind of do a bit of a gap analysis, you know, knowing after you go through and sell this product a few different places, seeing where commonalities are and also benchmarks relative to other organizations. I think organizations are always so eager to hear those market benchmarks. And so being, bringing, being able to bring in both those, like here's how other folks have done it, here's what best in class looks like, here's the benchmarks you can measure yourself against, as well as let me take, you know, let me meet with a few people, do a couple of interviews and understand where your pain points are and come back to you with where I think we can help you streamline, or you can just on your own streamline the process as we implement this new product, I think um, can be really helpful because invariably, even if you were to completely outsource credentialing, there's still going to be components that will require inputs from the home organization. And so some of that residual inefficiency of the organization is probably going to carry through and that will help the product network that will could be barriers for the product working as well. So I think there's added benefit to the company as well as digging in there a bit. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's like with health right, there's sort of just like established belief that this is just the way it is too, that the system sort of have to be fragmented. It just like takes this long, you know, we've heard um, uh, organizations tell us it takes them, you know, north of 30, you know, 60 days to credential a provider. And so when we tell them, well, we can do that with automation and like a centralized platform in under 15 days, it's like, if you can do that, it's like magic. Right. And so, uh, it's really exciting to, be able to do those things for organizations because at the end of the day, it means more providers doing the good work and patients, um, getting the care that they need. So, uh, I guess like if I can offer from uh, the external partner perspective, right, the side of the partnership um, who really should be and is responsible for impacting the returns that you all have talked about, we certainly think about ROI in that more sort of dynamic, holistic way. Uh, I think because it keeps us accountable to the broader goals of uh, the organizations we partner with. Uh, and so whether an organization decides to establish an external partnership uh, to manage their network operations or simply to leverage software. Uh, to make uh, their teams more efficient. Uh, the partnerships uh, they invest in should pay dividends in a multitude of ways, right? Outside of just the cost reductions. Uh, so if that partnership can provide your organization benefits like faster turnaround times, um, uh, uh, employee time savings, accuracy in workflows, right? Insight to data uh, to make more like actual, actual uh, uh, decisions. Uh, that can be a major unlock for the overall growth of the organization. Uh, you can expand to new markets it's faster, right? Maintain more reliable revenue streams, uh, and with a good product, right? That makes the provider and staff administrative tasks easier. Uh, we should see improved satisfaction that can lead to better hiring and retention metrics uh, across those groups. Uh, and so uh, that brings us to our second poll question: uh, What ROI model is most important to you? We just pose this to the group. Awesome. All right. So pretty, a uh, pretty uh, even distribution. About the thirty-six percent say cost savings, uh, which makes sense. Uh, uh, Thirty or twenty-seven percent time savings. Twenty-four percent potential lost revenue savings um, with headcount savings and our growth uh, coming in and last at 12%, uh, although it makes sense uh, across sort of uh, by and large those those three categories, all very important to measure in an overall ROI model for organizations. Um, all right, so I wanna move into sort of like tactical advice for the audience. Um, as it relates to ROI and selling up internally to executives, uh, I imagine our audience wants, would love to hear your advice uh, for making a business case uh, to the leadership team to invest in tools, uh, technology or resources uh, uh, to meet their needs. Especially at Lindsay, as we mentioned, there can be some resistance, right? In the healthcare organization uh, landscape uh, to do so. Maybe we start with you, Lindsay. Yeah, um, I think um, maybe just um, maybe I want to answer, talk a little bit about the ROI piece, just to provide folks with a little insights on on this uh, and how we think about it. So I, I want to just uh, share that a couple things that are just good, depending on the size of the organization that you come into. Ours is huge, so figuring out both how, like, what is the organization strategy and what are their top priorities, and then who are the constituents that you're working with, because they're going to have different perspectives on ROI. And so if you're working with the ortho physicians or the hospital leaders, they're going to be thinking about um, bed turnover, length of stay, um, staffing costs, those sort of things. But if you're working with 
um, finance department that may oversee supply chain, you know, they're going to be thinking about, you know, um, supply chain costs. And so I think there is just, it's important to just understand what are the priorities for the organization and then who are your constituents. Um, so I just wanted to share that perspective. Um, I think then in terms of the other piece to say about ROI and thinking about some of the challenges that we face in terms of pitching things internally or having an external person pitch um, is that there isn't often a standardization around how a leader wants to view things. And so there's a bit of nuance around who are you pitching to and how do they view things? And so even within our finance um, group, I don't think there's a standard way. And so that's some of the challenges I think that we often come across. And so it requires a little bit of like um, um, collaboration inside and outside with the external partner to kind of help them navigate the inside system of figuring out like who did, of course, like who should they talk to and how do they talk to them and what's their perspective, but also kind of help in thinking about how to um, frame the ROI um, pitch. The last thing I'll say is like, there's always just this distrust of outside of like, do we really believe the ROI of a sales team and what do you make of that? And so I think just being transparent about that, like, and uh, not trying to oversell data, oversell what your uh, stats are. I think just being earnest about that actually carries more weight, at least in my organization, than trying to convince someone in a sales pitch of data that may be limited. Yeah, yeah. And I think like I, it is like incumbent on the organizations that you partner with or that you're you're considering. They sort of help you with those like if if then statements to then share back with your team, right? So like if we can do this for you and we demonstrate this value in practice, right, then you know, what does that mean for our partnership? And it sort of having those outlined um and set, like I said, in collaboration, I think does like uh help with confidence building and internally. Yeah, one of yeah. one other comment, Jessica, sorry, is also yeah. thinking about the pricing models is when resources are tight, thinking about pricing models that where you're willing to take risk on outcomes and, and performance guarantees and things like that, I think can be really helpful of feeling, having I found um, both for myself as well as for colleagues, feeling like you have a partner that's kind of aligned on incentives. And so that can be a really helpful way to build trust and get your foot in the door. Yeah, absolutely. That transparency and pricing too, feeling like the model like makes sense and is fair to your organization. Absolutely. Matthew, uh, how about from your your side? Yeah, I would I would say, you know, be as far as advice, be strategic and, and really mindful of the business case um, that you're trying to sell and ensure that it speaks to the corporate goals and objectives um, kind of laid out by the executive leadership team. I know here at FCC, we're very strategic and and very um very, you know, strict on our goals as an organization, you know, we, um, we try to really line those out. And those are, you know, those are kind of filtered out throughout the whole organization. So everyone is responsible for those organizational goals. So, you know, really trying to make sure that your business case is in line with those. Um, you know, if you're laying out plans to advance the, the those company um, objectives and, and can speak to the way that that business case and whatever it is that you're trying to, you know, push the leadership um, will make a positive impact. I think that you're going going to find success. Um, so that that would kind of be my my main piece of advice is is also um, ensuring that you know what you know what type of ROI your leadership team is really uh, focused on and and what really speaks to them. You know if they're really um, concerned with how much time that you're going to save the organization, um, whether your leadership team is really focused on just cutting costs as much as possible, you know, really trying to uh, do your homework and make sure that you're on top of that um, as you're building that case can just be really, um, really beneficial. Yeah, I'm actually going to sprinkle in uh, one of the audience questions now. Uh, so question um, is, from an ROI perspective, how do you measure a better or improved experience for both patients and staff? So curious from, from your side, like sort of what are those metrics? Um, how are you measuring? Yeah, that experience for from patients and staff. So I know for, you know, with, with our decision to um, outsource the pay enrollment side of things, you know, the, the main measurement that we are looking at is how fast can we deliver care? You know, with behavioral health, access to care is a huge problem right now throughout the entire country. You know, you can look at every single state. Um, it doesn't matter where you are in the country. There may be some areas that are, you know, better than others, but access to care um, for, for mental health is, uh, you know, it's, it's basically in a crisis. So, you know, how can we get patients into care as fast as possible? Um, and, you know, ensuring that you've got the credentialing function operating as efficiently as possible is the number one kind of, you know, goal there. You know, we can hire as many providers 
as we want to hire in a given state or or market if those folks are not credentialed with the health plans that we're in network with and it really it's all for naught you know so that's that's a major um you know form of measurement that that we you know outlay um upon our organization um for the staff you know it's obviously things like how how can we um you know make this as easily manageable as possible with with you know I don't want to say a limited number of folks because we're not trying to limit our workforce, so to speak, but um, how can we avoid, you know, just packing ourselves down with, you know, this uh, an overarching team and, and you know, avoiding that, um, you know, that's been something that's been really helpful is, of course, we have to have folks internally to help manage the process. We can never fully just give up the whole, you know, credentialing and payer enrollment process, and not have anyone kind of providing oversight, but, you know, to have three people managing it opposed to a team of 10 um that's you know a, a major um valuation for us when we're looking at ROI and, and how we can um see returns there yeah absolutely I mean capacity gains that then translate to right more capacity for your patients and and uh uh lower turn uh, uh appointment times absolutely uh, Lindsay how about from your perspective yeah um in terms of patient satisfaction um we use traditional patient satisfaction metrics and surveys, but we also do a lot of patient reported outcome measures. I think we have the biggest repository in the country of these. And so increasingly moving towards, are we measuring outcomes that matter to patients? Uh, so not just um, if you got a joint replacement, uh, did it go well? Did you get a readmission? Did you get an infection? But you know, how functional is your knee after that versus before having the knee replacement? And so I'm really moving in that direction of holding ourselves accountable for those um, outcomes that measure to patients that only they can report. I think that's a cultural change that we're starting to do. Um, and then in terms of um, employee satisfaction on things, um, this is we do this tend to do it more department by department. And within mine, we do uh, measure an employee net promoter score uh, satisfaction metric that we check and do pulse checks on on a regular basis just to get a sense of how people are doing and actively respond to that. Yeah. Um, yeah, really, really, really helpful. Actually, as a follow-up from that, I'm going to pull in another audience question. Uh, someone asks, uh, the challenges with ROI is our potential new vendor uh, needs a customer to measure uh, ROI. When you take a chance uh, with a new technology solution in the process of measuring ROI, So this actually, this I think like bleeds nicely into uh, the next question, which is sort of like, what, what attributes do you look for in a partner? Um, and I think that could maybe get you comfortable with a, with a, a newer player in the space. Yeah, um, I, I missed the end part of the first question. Uh, repeat that, repeat the end part of that first question. Yeah, so that they ask uh, the challenge with ROI is uh, your potential new vendor needs customers to measure ROI. When do you take yeah. a chance with a new technology? I see, when you don't yeah, have any solution. customers, you haven't mm -hmm. done it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think uh, on that one, you know, we end up doing a lot of kind of co-development work within our organization. I mean, we are a massive research organization. Um, we have the most NIH research dollars of any hospital in the country. So, you know, uh, and as the world has changed, the research is not always at a wet lab. Sometimes it's around digital technologies. So that's a great way that companies have figured out how to come in as partner with one of our you know, clinical researchers to try stuff out and do it in that setting where there hasn't been any data. Um, and then that builds a track record for them with patients and, um, but also internally. Um, in terms, and then the second question was around how do you, what is the due diligence you do around partnerships? Um, yeah. I think this gets back to like thinking about what is the problem that we're trying to solve? Um, and then what are the things that are most important to solve that problem? And then of course, like thinking about price and um, what are the likelihood of getting outcomes as well as risks to the organization? I think traditional healthcare tends to be in, in almost the bigger the health organization, the more risk adverse they are. And so that ends up being incredibly important. And so then that becomes more of a contractual exercise of how to protect ourselves from risk or how to minimize kind of the initial deployment to sort of ensure that you can work out risks along the way. 
Um, but there's a lot of gaps that we have in our organization. I think Matt's, you know, highlighting one, which is behavioral health is really gapped. And so we've actually done a lot of work with behavioral health organizations to fill our gaps. Um, I tend to be more on the services side than on the back end. And so, you know, a ton of different areas, um, nutrition and supports like that, that we're moving into the traditional healthcare just hasn't been able to provide. So we move more into the social determinant of health space. I see a lot of stuff on RPMs, starting to manage chronic diseases. Um, we're not a technology company, so looking for um, platforms and organizations can help us in that space are key areas for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I the think last thing I'll say is around this, the equity, like anyone who's coming to us, a really important piece to think about is what do you do um, from an equity standpoint? What do you do with different populations? How can you customize to that? Uh, I think if you haven't thought about that, you're not going to get far in our organization um, in terms of people, like the organization being able to buy into you. Yeah, absolutely. And I think like with a lot of these technologies that are just like inherently in the more nascent stages or organizations, it's like sort of a, it could be like controversial to think about using a technology or bringing in uh, a, a new vendor. Uh, the vendor, like, you know, bringing you, taking a more collaborative approach and having a really like crisp, clear understanding of right their product and how it's going to support your organization and also the ability and willingness to measure that with you, um, right, throughout the duration, like, so, so important and uh, can bring more confidence there uh, and a good indicator, right? Before you actually buy. Um, all right, last question uh, before we dig into some of the other uh, audience questions. Um, very curious, how are partnerships, whether that software uh, tools or outsourced uh, functions uh, supported the growth and sustainability of your business, like actually to date? Uh, I'm really curious to hear if you were sort of looking into your, your crystal ball, uh, had you not taken those approaches, what the impact would have been on the trajectory of your business uh, overall? Matthew, why don't we start with you? Yeah, yeah. So first, I know I, I kind of spoke to this earlier, but I'll say that from from my perspective, I think there are certain functions that that make more sense to outsource than others, um, and and there are certain functions that I'm less comfortable giving up the management of. Um, but in saying that, outsourcing our payroll enrollment credentialing function, you know, has been so impactful um, in a positive way for our growth, and and has had valuable me measurable impacts on our revenue. You know, we have tracked our credentialing timeframes. Um, you know, before I joined the organization. And if you look at what those timeframes are now um, compared to what they were before we outsourced the function, um, it's not even in, in the same, you know, ballpark. You know, it's it's increased um, so much and, and has gotten so much better as far as the time frame goes. That's the, you know, the number one measurement that we look at is how long does it take, you know, to get a provider um, enrolled with a payer that we have a contract with. And so that's a pretty easy um, measurement to make. Um, and so, you know, had we not gone down this path, um, I think we, we would probably still be having significant growing pains when it comes to, you know, enrolling our providers with our in-network plans, um, building out a team with the right people. Again, you know, that's, that's one of the hardest parts is trying to find folks that are well-versed in credentialing and are willing to stay in, in those types of roles for long periods of time. Um, internally, that's always been a struggle. Um, would we have been successful and found our rhythm? Perhaps, but I'm, I'm a big advocate of utilizing um, outsourced services as a way to kind of extend the life of, of the organization. Um, and so, you know, I, I am much happier where we are now and managing the credentialing function from a small, um, you know, viewpoint and just kind of providing oversight and making sure things are working well instead of really being in the weeds and, um, you know, dedicating a lot of time and resources and employee costs to those um to those processes yeah absolutely i mean you could spend just naturally that time back allocated to things like okay our care delivery model or what are the payer partnerships that are going to expand like you know uh, give us the biggest footprint uh in these different markets so absolutely great to hear that and Lindsay, how about from you Oh gosh, you know, as an organization, like I said, we're just recovering from believing we can do everything ourselves to getting into this. And so in some ways, I feel like we're kind of nascent and um, thinking about partnerships. Um, at the same time, we have tons of them. And with our strategy going forward, a lot of our strategy is contingent on not building it ourselves, but figuring out who are the strategic partners for us. And that's everything from huge technology platforms um, to logistics um, players to um, care providers. Uh, and so kind of thinking and looking to do all of that, that um, at our core, we're going to grow our health plan substantially, and we're going to always have our hospitals, but we're probably not going to be expanding as much as we might hope to on our own, a lot of um, 
services for where care is going. And so instead looking for strategic partnerships to be able to do that as we kind of morph and adjust into the future to be um, relevant for the communities as they need us um, tomorrow. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, okay. Well, with uh, the few minutes we have left, I definitely want to give the audience what they want uh, and jump into some of these questions. Um, this one's interesting. So they ask, uh, uh, how do you view wearables? I mean, just sort of when we're talking about technology broadly, uh, how do you view wearables as a way to deliver care more equitably? Um, I don't know, Lindsay, if this is a specific area uh, that you <laughs> you have a, a perspective on or, or um, yeah, your organization has delivered into? Yeah, um, I think there's tons of excitement around wearables. I think where we've seen wearables have an effect is those that are very interested in their own health. <laughs> that has tended to be people that are very engaged, tend to tend to be kind of um, middle upper socioeconomic status. They tend to be people that are, um, is, uh, are already relatively healthy. And so the that is um, great to see some of the technology working as a proof of concept. I think the challenge is it's less around getting wearables on people, but really managing conditions and improving outcomes and then thinking about some of the um, equity gaps that exist. And so what we're thinking about is like, okay, what are the different conditions that we can manage using technology plus some sort of human? And what is the right ways, what are the right engagements to do it with different populations? And so moving away from just saying like, there's one solution for everyone to saying, what are the different, how do we segment populations into different needs and barriers and start to develop different solutions for them? And I think all of our solutions are gonna need to be um, tech enabled. And that tech enablement can mean different things for people, it could be wearables. And for some people that might be phone calls, then that's the technology that they're using. And we just have to acknowledge that like there's, we have to meet people where they're at. And I will say that, you know, our healthcare organizations have really historically been designed around doctors, not around patients and consumers. And so we're just beginning to say like, gosh, we should go to our, um, the consumers and patients we serve and ask them, like, what are your barriers? What do you need? What's the best way to serve you? Can we put, um, rather than just picking up like the wearable or whatever the technology is in our, in our clinics or our hospitals, could we put it in a partner like a, um, a, a Walgreens or a, um, a Best Buy and, and have you pick up some of your technology there and learn to train it there with one of our people or one of their people. And so I think there's all sorts of creative ways that we're going to have to move closer to our, to our the people we serve and the communities that we serve. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then I'm going to close out with one other quick question. And, and Matthew, maybe I'll pose this one to you. You've already addressed some of, I think, some of this in, in, in previous sections, but how do you measure or value improved quality of care from a digital solution? So with our um, value-based contracts that we're starting to kind of move into, you know, um, quality of care is a huge measure, you know, um, how fast can you get patients into appointments? How fast can you get patients into, um, you know, their follow-ups? That's that's a huge measurement of one of our most recent agreements that we just executed is the, the follow-up appointment. Um, and all those things kind of tie back to, you know, um, the the function that we decided to outsource is, you know, how quickly can we get patients into care? Um, that's the most important thing for from our perspective. Um, that's the the kind of the fight that we're trying to fight is providing access to care. And then of course, you know, we also measure patient satisfaction. Um, we do patient satisfaction surveys after all of our visits. Um, we're also measuring, um, you know, the impact of, you know, anxiety and depression on folks as they go throughout their treatment of care. And, and so being able to measure those items, um, you know, digitally and, and house that information, um, being able to transfer it back and forth between ourselves and the payers that we partner with, um, you know, really impacts positive um, quality of care um, that make patients better, that make patients happier, um, and just healthier individuals. So, yeah, awesome. All right. Well, I really pushing us up to the limit. I'm going to wrap uh, with a really heartfelt thank you to both of you, Matthew and Lindsay, uh, for an insightful and engaging conversation and our audience for tuning in. I know we weren't able to get to all the questions, but we'll track those in, uh, try to follow up with you uh, async. Um, so thank you to the audience for tuning in again and, and uh, get health uh, for giving us this conversation. Thank you to our speakers and to everyone that joined us today please visit our website at hlth.com to catch up on all Health Go Live webinars. And join us in Las Vegas, October 8th through 11th for Health 2023.